County Landmarks Preservation Commission is now in session. Please note the meeting is being audio recorded. My name is John Holman, Chair of the Commission. I will be running tonight's meeting. We're your volunteer representatives appointed by our county council person or county executive and entrusted to monitor renovations and additions to our Baltimore County historic resources. We review and approve nominations to the Baltimore County preliminary landmarks list and comment on national register nominations. Additionally, we are charged with evaluating submissions to the Baltimore County historic tax credit program that encourages the appropriate maintenance and renovation of designated historic properties. Would the commissioners please introduce themselves by name and county council district or representation? We can go in the order listed on the PowerPoint point screen. Hi, my name is Lily Mundruff and I represent Council District 1. Chris Weston, District 2. John Holman, District 6, really, but Salisha, not here. Not Ray. here. Ray Scott, District 7. Maybe Jamie Scott. Scott Holupka, Planning Board Representative. Ed. Ed Hoard, Executive Appointment. Vince. Vince Johnson, Executive Appointment. And Chris Parks. Chris Parks, Executive Appointment. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And now we, we stand for our Pledge of Allegiance. You're ex excused, Chris Weston. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. The Landmark Preservation Commission operates under the authority, standards, and requirements of Title VII, Article 32 of the Baltimore County Code. We refer to the United States Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation as administered by the National Park Service. This is the accepted national standard for historic preservation projects. Our own Baltimore County Historic Preservation Design Guidelines directly reference and incorporate the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. We have important preservation issues to discuss and debate at each meeting. If you would like to make comments, please limit your comments to the specific application or proposal submission being reviewed. We ask for your assistance and understanding so that discussions do not digress. As an additional comment, we can all agree that historic preservation is an important aspect of the quality of life and place that makes Baltimore County unique. As a commission, we seek to recommend significant buildings and places for landmark consideration to the county council for their final vote. As commissioners, we serve on the commission due to our expertise, interest, and passion for historic buildings and places and review submissions based solely on their merit. While we may disagree in discussion and voting, we continue to be a collegial body that respects each other personally and professionally. Thank you. And then staff reminders for virtual meetings or? Sure, yes. Yeah. So, so staff reminder for offering testimony. Um, we updated this um, in January 1, having uh, members of the public uh, sign up uh, beforehand um, in order for staff to keep everything organized and announce those who um, sign up. Owners, applicants, and project representatives do not need to sign up. Um, we uh, we have a list of those uh, associated with um, an agenda item that are in attendance, so that we will be able to um, announce them and unmute them um, at the appropriate time. Um, right. In addition, yeah. <laughs> in, right, addition um, in addition, in uh, addition, the commissioners re receive all of the meeting materials um, one week prior to the meeting uh, for for review and preparation. Um, and the pack packet contains all of the information that um, applicants um, submit um, in addition to anything that staff um, includes that they might need um, background information or anything like that. So the information that is included in this presentation is just a summary of that information um, to keep the meeting moving in an organized manner. Good. Thank you. 
And um, Caitlin, do you want to do the special presentation now, or did you want to do that? Um, we'll, we'll do that now, get it out of the way. Okay, good. So we'll do a special or, presentation, and I'll turn it over to Caitlin. All right, I'm going to turn my video off for this. Sorry, I have all these video windows open on my computer trying to get the right one <laughs> open. All right. <clears throat> all right, welcome. Um, so today uh, the LPC will be reviewing um, a recent uh, nomination to the National Park Places, um, the Glenn L. Martin Company Plant Number no. 2. The nomination was received by MHT and they pass it along to us to review as part of our requirements um, as being a certified local government. Um, so Baltimore County um, is certified by the Maryland Historical Trust as a certified local government and is invited to uh, assess the nomination's eligibility for the National Register. Um, so we act as a CLG agency, um, the Landmarks Preservation Commission and the Baltimore County Executive will make a recommendation to MHT after um, the hearing and after listening to our presentation um, in support of or in opposition to the nomination based on um, the justification um, and documentation of the property's significance. So the Glenn L. Martin Company plant number two uh, was built between 1940 and 1942 as a satellite facility just east of the Martin plant number one and north of Martin Airport located at 2800 Eastern Boulevard in Middle River. It was constructed specifically to produce B-26 Marauder bombers for the Army by the Martin Company. The current site contains 10, resource, 10 resources, eight of which are con contributing and two are non-contributing. So the nomination, um, so National Register um, nominations, uh, properties must meet one or more of the four criteria um, that are uh, one or more of the four criteria of the National Register. Um, this property uh, nomination was submitted um, out of the four uh, criteria, the nomination for plant number two meets three of those criteria. Um, criterion A, Criterion B and Criterion C. So Criterion A um, is a property that is associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad pattern of our history. Um, and plant number two is significant for uh, its role in World War II as a primary production facility for the B-26 Marauder bomber from, the late, from late 1941 to 1945. And more than half of the B-26 produce were produced at plant number two. So criterion B, the property is associated with the lives of persons significant in the past. Um, plant number two is significant for its association with Glenn L. Martin, who by the time of its construction had established himself as one of the top military aircraft designers in the country, credited with the MB-1 bomber, the B-10 bomber, the China Clipper, Martin Mariner, and the and the huge Mars flying boat. And for Criterion C, um, the property embodies the distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction, or represents the work of a master, or or possesses high artistic values, or represents a significant and distinguishable entity whose components lack individual distinction. The property, um, uh, the, the plant number two is, uh, is significant as an example of the art modern style of architecture and is a major work of Albert Kahn, one of the premier industrial architects in the United States during that period. Um, and the period of significance for this property um, was determined to be from 1940 to 1947. So the Glen uh, L. Martin plant number two was built as a primary manufacturing facility 
for the war, World War II military aircraft. Um, again, known as the B-26 Marauder. Um, the B-26 allowed the Martin Company to continue to build upon their successes and introduced several innovative features, including an aerodynamically perfect fuselage and an all plexiglass bombardier's nose. However, at the time the war ended, the B-26 had the lowest loss rate among the U.S. Army Air Force planes. And the, the production of the B-26 ended in the mar March of 1945 with the delivery of a tail of tail end Charlie 30. The plant continued to, to contribute to the war effort to the manufacture and assembly of components for other aircrafts. The U.S. government gained ownership of the property in December 1947, and it remained in the government ownership until 2006. And based on that timeline, a period of significance for the site reflects the ownership of the plant by the Martin Company and its production of the B B-26s. So I'm going to start with going through some um, of the resource history and historic context and how they um, relate to the criteria justifications. Um, so in the early 1939, the U.S. Army Air Corps put out a request for bids for a new long-range medium bomber with the need for speed and the ability to carry 3,000 pounds of ordnance. The Glenn L. Martin Company submitted a design proposal in July of 1939 and was subsequ subsequently awarded the contract in April, beating out three other aviation companies. They received an order for 200 planes. The new plane was given the identification number of B-26 and then became known as the B-26 Marauder Bomber. The contract was unique in that there, were, there was no prototype to evaluate. So the first planes delivered as part of the initial order would need to be both test planes and mission ready. The timeline for delivery of the first planes was 12 months. Peyton Magruder, the design engineer for the B-26, incorporated a number of innovations in the plane, starting with the overall concept. In order to achieve the greatest amount of speed, the, B the B-26 uh, was originally designed with a shorter wingspan and a vertical stabilizer that was typical for its size and weight. These configurations combine the new landing gear and initially unreliable engine. Gave, uh, hold on, sorry, I jumped ahead, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, there we go. In order, yeah. Apologize, lost my place, sorry. He developed the first aerodynamically perfect fuselage for the plane. Additionally, it was the first aircraft to carry a power operated gun turret, the first to be fitted with an all plexiglass bombardier's nose, the first to employ an all electrical bomb release mechanism, and the first with a tripod landing gear that included a nose wheel rather than a trail tail wheel. In order to achieve the greatest amount of speed, the B-26 was originally designed with a shorter wingspan and a vertical stabilizer than was typical for its size and weight. These configurations combined with the new landing gear and the initial and an initially unreliable engine gave the B-26 a bad reputation and the nickname Widowmaker. Although the plane was intended to become a major part of the U.S. Pacific Combat Squadrons, the B-26 was not successful as hoped and only saw limited use. Even after several redesigns, the B-26 struggled to find a niche in the World War II. Uh, eventually, the plane provide, or eventually, the plane proved its worth in the European and Mediterranean theaters, both as a long-range fighter and as the first United States Air Force aircraft in Europe to perform precision bombing runs at night, targeting bridges and transports. As those problems were being resolved, marauders immediately went into combat after American entry into World War II. On June 4, 1942, Army Air Force marauders defending Midway Island attacked Japanese aircraft carriers with torpedoes, but failed to 
to score hits. The American, no, the Army Air Force sent marauders to North Africa after the Allied invasion in November of 1942 for service with the 12th Air Force. The 8th Air Force B-26s flew the first bombing mission against German forces in Europe on May 14, 1943. In preparation for the invasion of France, the 8th Marauders were transferred to the 9th Air Force, the preliminary American Tactical Air Force in Europe, in October of 1943. Like the M1 Durand combat rifle, the Sherman tank, and the LST, the Marauder was an important weapon in the war against Axis powers. B-26 crews flew over 100,000 raids and dropped approximately 150,000 tons of bombs against Nazi Germany. The Army Air Force lost fewer marauders than any Allied bomber it flew, less than one half, less than one half of 1%. Besides the U.S., the, US the, the Air Forces of Great Britain and France operated marauders in combat. Few marauders survive today out of the 5,226 produced by the Martin Company. The market, Martin Company did not have a facility that could be dedicated to the production of the plane at the time of the contract in 1939. While the design and construction for Plant 2 was fast-tracked in order to meet expected delivery in February of 1941, the first B-26s came off the production line. Plant number two became operational in late 1941, early 1942, and the production of the B-26 was transferred from plant number one, and, and then an additional production facility was constructed in Omaha, Nebraska, to support the demands of the schedule. With the increased importance of aviation in World War II, the federal government was not equipped to fund the additional capital costs, especially when the contractor was a private entity. Banks were hesitant to invest in many industrial properties where the risk of non-payment was high and the long-term profitability was low due to their highly specialized design. Contractors were also cautious about putting in large sums of their own money, construction, and tooling of this type of building for much of the same reason without a guarantee of a profit. To mitigate this funding impasse, the federal government created incentives to encourage a large to encourage the large private capital investments in facilities such as airplane manufacturing plants that were needed as part of the war effort. Programs were created, including the Emergency Plant Facilities Act. Under this program, the, a private contractor obtained the loan to construct a facility using his government contract as collateral. He was responsible for the loan payments during the con construction period. Once the facility was constructed and approved, the government began paying off the loan over a period of 60 months. And during this time, the contractor maintained ownership of the property, but it would transfer to the government at the end of the loan period. The owner was also given the opportunity to repurchase the property for a previously determined amount. The Glen L. Martin plant number two was one of only a few facilities to be constructed using the funding through the Emergency Plant Facilities Act. The upfront cost of construction was large and the design was based for the manufacturing needs of one specific type of plane. The return on investment was linked solely to the success of the B-26 Marauder. Given these parameters, the potential for the post-war profitability was almost impossible for a traditional private funder to evaluate. Without the funding through the Emergency Plane Facilities Act program, Plane number two would most likely have been much smaller in scale and possibly not built at all. In order to maximize the length of construction and thus the number of payments the Martin Company would have required to pay, designs from plant number one were altered and reused for plant number two. And then based on the chain of title for the property, the federal government completed their loan payments and took ownership of the property in 1947. And it remained in government ownership until 2006 when it was sold as a surplus property. So, Glenn L. Martin was an aviation pioneer. And he was born in Maxburg, Iowa in 1886. 
His lifelong fascination with aviation and both the aerodynamic and the mechanic aspects began in as early um, as a young boy when he won a contest for the design of a box kite. His family had um, moved to Kansas where he graduated from high school and attended a business college. He also worked as an automobile mechanic in a garage uh, and became the first uh, class auto mechanic. He moved with his family to California in 1905, where he got a job with a local mechanic and sub subsequently opened his own shop in 1906. Martin knowledge, Martin's knowledge of motors and their capabilities would prove to be quite valuable. Never having given up his interest in flying, Martin put his new expertise to use experimenting with designs for biplanes and gliders. After many failed attempts, Martin built a, and flew his first successful plane in 1908, in 1909, he established an airplane factory in Santa Ana, and by 1912, Martin moved his factory to Los Angeles and incorporated it as the Glenn L. Martin Company. He became one of the first, one of the leading expedition flyers, but also the leading manufacturer of planes during this period. Martin's early accomplishments included the first extended ocean flight from Newport Beach, California, to Catalina, Catalina Island, and also by transporting um, mail by air. Martin realized the potential for the use of airplanes by the military during wartime and peacetime tasks. With the beginning of World War I, Martin was ready to play a role in developing airplanes for the military. The Glenn L. Martin Company designed and produced the models T and Double T, which were training planes, um, as well as the Model S seaplane for the Army. He was the first to produce armored planes. And after a brief, par brief partnership with the Wright brothers from 1916 to 1917, forming the Wright Martin Corporation, Martin reintroduced or uh, reincorporated his business in Cleveland, Ohio. With his new business um, partner and design engineer, Donald Douglas, Martin continued to produce both military and civilian planes, including the first plane for mail service and a new, more powerful biplane that became known as the Martin Bomber. Martin's continued in interest in seaplanes prompt prompted the need to move to an area with a year-round water access. In 1929, he moved his aviation business to the Middle River area of Baltimore and started construction on the state-of-the-art 298,000 square feet manufacturing plant. While he continued to develop different aircraft designs, Martin focused on military contracts. He received accolades for, for the design and development of his B-10 bomber receiving a prestigious Collier Trophy for Excellence in Outstanding Aviation Design in 1932. The Martin Company's continued success in gaining military aircraft contracts required multiple expansions of plant number one during the 1930s and, and early 1940s to accommodate new, con new military contracts from both the U.S. Army and Navy. Additional buildings were built in 1937 and 1939 to accommodate the long wingspan of the PBM Mariner and the PB2M Mars, two examples of Martin's flying books. The receipt of the B-26 contract in 1939 meant that Martin needed to provide additional dedicated space to its production as plant number one was running at full capacity. So this led to the construction of plant number two. The art modern style popular in the 1930s and 50s played an important role in the early part of the modern movement in architecture. Along with art, the Art Deco style, it marks a distinct break with the past to create a more modern style, one that embraced the future and its involving transportation technology. The art modern style is not commonly used in single family residence, residential architecture, but rather in larger building types, including multifamily residential commercial, public, or industrial buildings. Key characteristics of the style include horizontal linear orientation to the building achieved by the use of flat roofs, ribbon steel sash windows, casement windows, curved or corner windows, and a smooth, ex smooth exterior wall surfaces. Aluminum, stainless steel, and steel detailing was used to further emphasize the horizontal movement of the style. Albert Kahn's designs for the Martin plant number two incorporated massing and design elements consistent 
with the art modern style to express the industrial nature of the building. Albert Kahn was born in Germany in 1869 and came to the United States with his family in 1881, settling in Detroit, Michigan. Since Kahn's schooling, uh, formal schooling ended in the seventh grade for family financial reasons, he was fortunate to gain prominent apprenticeships, finding lifelong mentors who helped him develop his raw talent. Kahn took drawing lessons from the sculptor Julius Theodore Melcher, who he met during his apprenticeship. Melcher played a, a pivotal role in Kahn's decision to pursue a career in architecture, as well as assisting him with his next position. Kahn began a, an, an apprenticeship with Mason and Rice, a prominent architectural firm in Detroit in 1883. He flourished at the firm and in 1890 won a prestigious scholarship from the American architect, allowing him to study abroad for a year. Kahn returned to Mason and Rice after his travels but by, but by 1896, he had formed a partnership with two other architects from the firm to form Nettleton, Kahn, and Throwbridge. But by 1901, Kahn had decided to pursue his own practice, which remains in existence today, initially gaining residential and public building design contracts. Um, Kahn was equally adept at designing uh, non-industrial buildings such as uh, residential, commercial, and institutional um, structures. And some of his early projects in Detroit and the surrounding area include the Palms Apartment Building, which was constructed in 1902 in the classic revival style, um, the Temple, Temple Beth L, 1903 Beaux-Arts style, and the William L. Clements Library, 1923, and the uh, Italian Renaissance style, which is on the University of Michigan campus and the Fisher Building, which is 1927 Art Deco style. It just shows a breadth of his talent. Um, it was a recommendation from one of his residential clients, Joseph Boyer, um, to Henry Joy, who was the general manager of the Packard Motor Company, um, which would shift his focus of his career. So Henry Joy was overseeing the Packard Company's move from Ohio to Michigan and had plans to, look, to create a large automobile complex factory in Detroit. He sought out Albert Kahn, Albert Kahn to design the first buildings in 1903. While Kahn had no previous experience in building factories, he had built a reputation as a problem solver. His initial designs utilized traditional multi-story wood frame construction with masonry walls. Um, but those, these provided, proved to be inefficient solutions for the modern type of manufacturing processes. Um, during the same period, Kahn had been working with his brother Julius Kahn, who was an engineer, on developing a reinforced concrete structural system. And with Julius taking the lead, uh, their work resulted in the patented um, Kahn system for reinforced concrete. The 1905 building number 10 at the Packer plant, which was a multi-story assembly building, proved just the opportunity to use the system. Using an exposed reinforced concrete structural frame provided for larger open spaces on the assembly floor, creating built-in flexibility for use. It also allowed for larger window openings allowing for more natural light and ventilation. The exposed concrete uh, frame with infilled materials created an aesthetic that became synonymous with modern designs for factories of all types. Um, Albert Kahn continued to evolve his design philosophy for manufacturing facilities through his work with Henry Ford on several projects, including Highland Park and the River Rouge plants. Henry Ford was an early proponent of the moving assembly line and it became key to the success of the Model T car. At Highland Park, Kahn's design for the main building uh, circa 1910, continued the aesthetic he had achieved at the Packard plant, but on a much larger scale. It was an 860 foot long reinforced concrete framed building with exterior walls made almost entirely of steel sash multi light windows. The building was successful at accommodating the manufacturing process, but at the same time, the disadvantages of the multi story building for use of the new moving assembly line process became very apparent. So Ford's uh, River Rouge plant 
provided Khan with the opportunity to experiment with structural steel construction and different enclosure methods. He was evolving his understanding of these from the standpoint of cost and efficiency, and also including construction speed and the overall aesthetics. He continued to explore the use of natural lighting and ventilation, um, opening up walls and utilizing various skylights or roof monitors. Um, at the center of all his design decisions was that the building needed to be to have the required space to accommodate the various functions required for specific manufacturing purposes. Which is most most likely why the Martin company hired him. So plant number one at Martin State Airport, which is just south of where building um, building two is located, uh, was originally constructed in uh, 1929 when the Martin Company moved to Middle River. In 1937, the Martin Company retained the design services of our Khan to design the first addition to plant number one complex, one that could be used to assemble planes with a 300 foot wingspan. Khan was asked to design and construct a 300 foot by 450 foot building with a full width, clear span, high volume space. An additional requirement was that one end wall was to open completely to allow the plane to move out in its fully assembled form. No building had been built to date with that with this long of a flat span. In order to accomplish the requirement, Khan utilized bridge construction technology to develop a structural system using two different types of trusses, the Pratt stress, stress and the Warren stress. The size and depth of the spacing and the, of the trusses also allowed for the creation of a large box and rectangular light monitors spanning the full width of the building. Again, in 1939, Khan was contracted to complete another addition to plant number one. The 1939 addition to plant number one was constructed in a similar manner using smaller steel column grid and stacked trusses. The roof monitors have a wing-shaped appearance and profile, which allows for a large quantity of light. So the receipt of the uh, B-26 contract in 1939 meant the Mar Martin Company uh, needed to provide additional dedicated space to its production um, as plant number one was uh, running at full capacity, as I mentioned before. So again, uh, Martin um, hired Khan uh, for the design of this new plant. So the quick pace of the design and construction schedule for the new plant was dictated by, by the required delivery date for the first bombers. So as a result, building designs from plant number one were revised and reused for plant number two, rather than coming up with original designs for a new plant. The Martin plant number two can be seen as a synthesis of Albert Kahn's in industrial de design explorations, acknowledging the requirements for speed of construction and efficient efficiency and function. Kahn developed a site plan around a large central combined manufacturing or assembly building um, which was his first time utilizing this concept. The main assembly building and the auxiliary buildings um, that provided support services for the manufacturer, the B-26, were constructed in a limited time, which allowed for the development of a cohesive design that would accommodate the flow of a, manu of a manufacturing process from materials to product. The main assembly building combined elements from both the 1937 and 1939 additions to plant number one into one structure. The final assembly space incorporated mm -hmm. elements, both structural and roof monitors from the 1937 building, whereas the component um, assembly area incorporated <coughs> elements from the 1939 um, plant number one additions. The overall structural system was a combination of reinforced concrete at the lower level and the uh, steel frame on the upper level. Uh, the two systems balanced each other with their strength. Use, use of uh, reinforced concrete for the larger uh, assembly floors supported by, by mushroom columns at the lower um, 
lower levels supported the heavy weight of the load. Reinforced uh, concrete was also utilized for the foundation and finished wall of the sill of the first four windows. The use of steel frames allowed for large open spans uh, spaces required for the assembly of the B-26. The structural steel system was designed in-house um, by, with, by in-house engineers and in a partnership with Julia Kahn's company. While the reinforced concrete floor is contiguous across the entire four, 450 foot by 650 foot um, building, it was unique that there are two different structural steel systems within it to accommodate the different types of manufacturing functions. The final assembly space required a larger or a longer open span um, space and higher volume space than. The component, the component assembly space. The two spaces still needed to work seamlessly together as a unit for the production of the B-26. This was accomplished by using a rectangular structural grid that could be enlarged in the final assembly area to accommodate the finished planes. As in, ni ni as in the 1937 building at plant number one, the system of stacked trusses utilizing uh, the Pratt Trust to create the, the necessary 200-foot span was used in the final assembly building. And the component followed the structural design of the 1939 building with the Warren Trust. This combination of structural elements based on bridge building te technologies was unique uh, to these plans um, designed by Kahn just uh, for the manufacture of aircraft. As a part of the process, Khan evaluated his building designs on the base of worker productivity. Several elements, including lighting, ventilation, and movement of products. Plant number two utilized multi layers of lighting, both artificial and natural. The use of natural light played a large role in the overall design of the building massing and layout. Both visually and functionally, the large ribbon windows and the roof light monitors are significant design elements to the building. The two-way roof monitors provided non-directional light, which was important so there were no shadows cast upon the assembly floor. Both window systems provided pivoting venting elements to assist with ventilation. Um, the aesthetic of the exterior walls was not limited by the structural steel frame system. Instead of expressing the structure on the, on the exterior, Khan utilized a system of large ribbon windows and metal panels that wrapped around the entire main building. The metal panels and reinforced concrete lower walls were then covered with a gunite for a uniform finish. This created a minimalist aesthetic while providing the necessary natural light, ventilation, and clearances for the processes contained within. Consistent with the international style and the mo modern movement within it, the buildings express their industrial function with massing and fenestration. And just to, to go over as, as a summary, um, the Glenn Martin uh, Company plant number two, a significant under criteria one for its role uh, as a for its role in World War II as a primary production facility for the B-26 Marauder bomber from late 1941 to 1945. And it derives additional significance under Criterion B for its association with Glenn Martin, who at the who by the time of its construction had established himself as one of the top military aircraft designers in the country. And finally, it is significant as a major work of Albert Kahn, the premier industrial architect in the United States during the period, and it also reflects um, art, modern elements of style. And again, the period of significance was determined to be 1940 to 1947, which reflects the ownership of the plant by the Martin Company and its production of the B-26. Right, thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Yes, one, a wonderful presentation. I appreciate it. 
And so your recommendation is to vote to recommend the Glen L. Martin Company Plant 2 to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places on the criteria as proposed. And we're citing the Maryland Certified Local Government Program Procedures Manual National Park Service. So with that, I open it up to the commissioners for discussion. Any, uh, anybody want to put a motion on the floor? And uh, I have a clarification question. Sure, Scott. What's the impact of the building getting on the National Register? So this uh, National Register nomination was a mitigation um, effort, I believe, through a Section 106 process um, because the property was formerly owned by the government and when it was sold by a surplus, um, as a surplus, there was a, a, a preservation easement that was put on the building. So now the um, building is in private ownership and eventually going to be redeveloped. Um, this is just because it has to go through approvals through MHT. So this is just part of that process. Um, again, the National Register is a um, honorary uh, designation. There is no um, local, you know, uh, it's, not, it's not as restrictive as like a local landmark designation. Um, it does allow the building to uh, the owners to utilize our uh, tax credit programs, uh, our, our local um, tax credit program and the state tax credit program for any um, preservation efforts in its, um, you know, uh, future adaptive reuse. One of the things that's one way of saying it is it doesn't have a stick. We can't stop them from doing certain things, although the easement might. But we can, but it does provide a carrot to developers to be able to use, take advantage of historic tax credits, federal, local, state, uh, et cetera, which might be available to them. So it's a, a way to try to preserve uh, historic buildings and give some incentives because there are some extra costs to working with historic buildings. And this gives an incentive and an assistance to developers to maintain those buildings and keep them. And I think this is a spectacular example of art modern uh, of manufacturing buildings. And Khan is one of the, you know, the preeminent builders of these huge, huge uh, manufacturing plants all around the country. And uh, he's done some thing and it's lucky we have one and it's in relatively good condition and it hopefully can be used in a good way in Baltimore. And I know that there have been attempts to try and do something with the site. Yeah. Well, I also know it's also right by the Mark station, though. So it would seem to be a, an area that could, you know, be transit oriented development that could be. So I'm just curious what the implications were. But you're saying that there's already some sort of historic easement when the property was transferred. I would like to make a, a motion that uh, we um, encourage and, and, uh, accept that this should be on the National Register of Historic Places and uh, suggest that the county executive uh, su support this. And we have a second time. Th thank you, Brown. So any, any further discussion, commissioners? Hear, hearing none, can we do a, um, a roll call vote, Jessica? Can we have Lily, please? Yes. Chris Parts. Yes. Chris Weston. Yes. Ed. Yes. Scott. Yes. Jamie. Yes. Ray. Yes. Vince. Yes. And John, please. Yes. Great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And then the next item is the consideration of changes to today's agenda? No reported changes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Then minutes of the February 9th meeting. Um, has everybody had a chance to look at those? And if so, may I have a motion to approve them? To move that we approve the minutes. Thank you, Chris, and a second. And a second. I'll second Ed Horton. <laughs> Thanks, Ed. 
And then we'll do by voice vote. All, all in favor of accepting the minutes, say aye. 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 And opposed? Good. Thank you very much. And then consent agenda items? Sure, we have uh, one item on the consent agenda, um, number six, the McMillan property, located at 5167 Viaduct Avenue in Relay County Council District number one. This is a contributing structure in the Relay County Historic District, and the applicant is uh, looking for a tax credit part two for various structural repairs and replacements to the main beam, sill plate, joist, and jack posts. Uh, of her home uh, staff recommends to vote to issue a certificate of appropriateness as proposed citing Baltimore County historic design guidelines facade materials pages 1 through 12 county code section 327405. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, commission does anybody um, want to pull back into the regular agenda? If not, could I have a motion to accept the consent agenda item six? I move that we accept the consent agenda. Thank you, Chris. A second? I'll second, Ed Hoard. Thanks. Thanks, Ed. And I think we should do roll call again, um, Jessica. Okay. Uh, could we please have Lily? Yes. Chris Parts? Yes. Chris Weston? Yes. Ed? Yes. Scott. Yes. Jamie. Yes. Ray. Yes. Vince. Yes. And John, please. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Then we'll move into the um, regular agenda. And, yep. uh, um, Jessica, are you up for item four, or is that Kate? Yep. Yes. You can do it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Jessica. Okay, agenda item number four. This is the Gallagher property located at 703 Abel Ridge Circle in Towson County Council District number two. This is the Ridge Lot 12 single property district. Um, and the applicant is proposing uh, construction of an in ground pool and pool house in the rear yard. Some background on the single property historic district. Uh, Ridge Mansion is a two and one half story dwelling constructed in 1892 through 1893 in the Beaux Arts style. The structure was occupied as a dwelling through the early 20th century and subsequently served as the Ridge School from 1955 to 2000. School additions were constructed and connected to the mansion during that time. The property was placed on the final landmarks list in 2002 and was delineated as a single property district lot 12 by county council bill 18-06 when the property was sold and the land was subdivided the mansion was restored to its previous exterior appearance between 2005 and 2006 the later school additions were removed and present property and setting was created for work item number one, the owners wish to construct a 40 foot by 20 foot in ground pool with a six inch uh, porcelain water line tile and plaster interior. The pool will be constructed in the center of the rear yard, just off of the rear covered portico. The existing yard is a flat grassy area. To the west is an existing detached garage constructed in 2006. For work item number two, the owners proposed to construct a 970 square foot pool house off the northwest corner of the house, west of the proposed pool. The pool house design will be similar to the detached garage on the opposite side of the yard. It will be one story with a steeply pitched hipped roof with a total height of 18 feet. The hipped roof will be covered with the Da Vinci faux slate and will have a copper half round gutters and downspouts. The exterior will be similar to the existing garage with a brick foundation and clad in hardy panel board and batten. The windows will be wood clad, Lowen or Marvin. Uh, the windows on the east elevation, which faces the pool, will have a series of multi side pocket doors with a colonial grid centered under the covered portico. A series of bifolding windows with a colonial grid will be on either side. The remaining windows on the other elevations will be casement style windows with a colonial grid. The rear elevation has a centered stone chimney flanked by a multi-slide door system on each side. The south elevation that faces the mansion will have a centered style leaf half light wood door flanked on either side with a single casement window. The north elevation has two casement windows. 
And as a note, the existing site and around the mansion was created in 2005 through 2006 when the Ridge Schools property was subdivided and has no historic significance to the mansion or district. Staff has no issues with the proposed work items. The design of the pool house and proposed materials are compatible with the historic mansion and are consistent with the existing detached garage. In addition, the new construction is located in the rear and won't be highly visible from the front. Staff does note that there was no mention of any pool fencing in the application and wants to reiterate to the applicant that any further fencing needs to be approved by the LPC and meet our design guidelines as well as the regular building code before it is installed. Staff recommends uh, approval as proposed, citing uh, Baltimore County Historic Design Guidelines, Additions and Infill, pages one through seven, and Fences and Landscape, pages one through seven, County Code section 32-7, Dash four oh five. Thank, thank you, Jessica. Mm -hmm. do, do we have anybody here to speak from the property ownership or the architect's we, office? We do. They are in attendance and are prepared to answer questions, but uh, have not indicated um, they'd like to speak. In otherwise. Okay. Well, th thank you for being here, listeners. And um, any discussion from the um, commissioners? Hearing none, are, are we ready to go to a motion? I'll move that we approve. I think this is a, a beautiful set of drawings and I, this is what I love to see because we can actually tell what's going to happen with this house, with yeah. this uh, addition. It's very clear, concise, and it's beautifully done. I think it's, uh, should be very happy to see it in Baltimore County. Good, good. Thank you. I move that we, uh, uh, what should I be saying here? Uh, <laughs> Just move. We move, move to, uh, that we uh, approve it. Uh, certificate of appropriateness. Thank you. I, I, could I have a just a quick question? Sure, Vince. I, I couldn't. I'm on my wife's computer and I had a hard time kind of um, get get unmuted. Um, I just had a quick. The fence is that required? A fence is required. Um, for a pool for safety. For a pool of six, yeah, a six foot fence is required for a pool. Okay. In this case, that would not hold them. on our end. That would not hold up us our vote at all, right? So the fence was not included in this application, so that's why um, staff mentioned that if, when they do um, propose a fence, they would need to come back and propose that. Okay. Okay. All right. We're approving what's here. We know there a fence has to be put in, and when they put that fence or put that in for permit, they have to come to us first. Perfect. Okay, gotcha. Thank so you. So there should, shouldn't be an issue that so, um, so if it follows part, our guidelines. Part, part of what we're approving is we await a second as approving this with the appropriate um, as a certificate of appropriate appropriateness is also delegating to staff the ability to approve the fence as it comes through so that it doesn't have to come back fully through us, right, Caitlin? Um, it would be nice if that could be a case, but it would still have to come before you. It probably, if it met our guidelines, it would just be on the consent agenda. Okay, okay. Um, okay. Which would be an easy approval anyway, as sure. how most of our fence applications do sure. end up on the consent I'm agenda. Just trying to not hold up their, their work. Um, and then may we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Chris. And well, that was Vince. Oh, that was Vince. Thanks, Vince. Okay. Thank my, I've got something something going on. With my, I don't know if it's allergy or what, but I, I sound really weird to me, so I'm sure I sound weird to everybody else. So weird that you sound like Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jessica, can we do a roll call vote? Sure. Can we have Lily, please? Yes. Chris Parts? Yes. Chris Weston? Yes. Ed? Yes. Scott? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Ray? Yes. Vince? Uh, yes. And John, please? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And then next up is number five, the Battle Acre. 
Yes, this and is uh, Battle Acre, Baltimore County Department of Rec and Parks property located at 3115 North Point Road, County Council District number seven. Uh, this is a county final landmark number 19, Battle Acre. And the applicant proposes to install an eight foot wide, 88 foot long concrete walkway from the existing rear west fence opening to the Battle Acre Monument in the center of the park. This work is intended to connect the park to the future Bear Creek Heritage Trail route. A concrete apron will be laid at the existing fence opening. A 16 foot long flush curb will separate the concrete paving, uh, the adjacent asphalt alley. Some grading will be done in the limit of disturbance to grade where needed to meet ADA requirements. Any disturbed area immediately surrounding the pavement will be seeded or sodded when the work is complete. And as a note, the LPC has uh, approved the gate design for this missing section of fencing at its March 10th, 2022 meeting. The current application does not mention uh, the gate or its design, and staff asks that the commission discuss this with the applicant to determine if there are no changes in the gate design as a result of this project. Staff recommendation is to vote to issue a certificate of appropriateness as proposed, citing Baltimore County Historic Design Guidelines, Fences and Landscapes, pages 1 through 5, County Code section 327-405. Jess, could we have anybody to speak for or against this? Um... We do. We have uh, several speakers um, who have provided um, testimony written, which has been circulated to the commissioners this afternoon. And we have uh, several folks who would like to, to speak um, on behalf of the project here tonight. So we did have um, submitted testimony for those who who are not choosing to, to to speak at the meeting. So we had four um, letters um, in support of the project, um, and then we had one letter that was in opposition to the project. Which those, yeah, ago like Jessica mentioned, those were all those were all circulated to the commission today. So, so um, just to be clear, we have some folks who would like to speak. They're allotted two minutes. And then they're allowed um, three minutes, yes. Uh, they three minutes, I'm sorry. With, yeah, they signed up previously um, uh, with staff. And, and you'll guide us through that then. You you can uh, um, unmute them as uh, in turn. Yes. yes. Okay. Why don't we start with that and then we'll we'll have staff staff discussion, um, commission yeah. discussion and vote. Yeah. I'm gonna be putting a timer up um so that everybody can see rather than having me interrupt. To tell them they have to <laughs> wrap it up um, and that takes away time. Um, so our first speaker is going to be Tasha Gresham James and she's with uh, the uh, Dundalk Renaissance. How is it, everyone? Um, thank you for allowing me to come and speak. I will be very brief <laughs> after being in Annapolis uh, this week. I, I know to keep my time short. So I just want to. <laughs> I just want to uh, just speak briefly in support. Uh, this project has been long overdue. We've been, um, it, it's a part of a phase project, but we definitely are in favor of, of, of this plan and, and the project itself. And we are just hoping to um, continue on. Uh, and I also, not only am I representing on behalf of Dundalk Renaissance, but also a resident. Um, I live um, very close to North Point, um, Batter Acre Park. And I just would like to say that this is really a good um, project as far as just making sure that people have access to it and that they get to enjoy it um, and, and just making it more user-friendly. So really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Tasha. Appreciate it. And next up, um, we do we did have um, um, Phyllis George, who's the executive director of Neighborhood Space, but she's also in, involved um, with the project too. Um, so she can also uh, speak on any uh, questions or comments that the commission have um, regarding uh, the anything with the design. Um, in addition, we also have the the. Uh, contractor um, online as well. But let me see. All right, Phyllis, you're you're unmuted. 
if you'd like to address the commission. Um, yes, I'll, I not sure I can be as brief as Tasha, but I will try. So yes, I'm the executive director of neighbor space. We have been working since 2014 with the community to um, get their vision of a, of a trail. Bring that into reality. The trail will connect um, North Point State Battlefield with Battle Acre Park, several schools um, in the area, and then the Bear Creek waterfront. And all of that will be connected to the Star Spangled National Historic Trail. So the idea is that it will provide access to the waterfront, but um, most importantly, illuminate the history of Bear Creek and its role in the in the War of 1812. So this this proposal here is just a short piece of that trail, but it is a really important one. It's the first um, first design element that we have to show thanks to the county executive's generous support um, and a grant from Baltimore County that is funding the design and construction of this of this first phase. Um, we think that the so I do want to illuminate that the whole this whole process is um, driven by the is led by the steering committee Bear Creek steering committee and that committee is a group consisting of neighbor space representatives um, representatives of community groups like Tasha who we just heard um, Dundalk Patapsco Neck Historical Society and then we have the Baltimore County Department of Planning has a someone sitting on the committee um, as well as individual community members and historians. So we discussed several possible trail alignments through Battle Acre Park, consulted with the broader community, met with the different Baltimore County departments that are involved with improvements and maintenance at the park. And this is the proposal that the committee voted to move forward with, um, because we think this will really, like Tasha said, really allow community members and visitors to better enjoy the monument and the mural at the park. Um, and to better engage with the underlying history. And I did want to mention that we, Neighbor Space was also awarded a separate grant by the National Park Service's American Battlefield Protection Program to perform historical research with a focus on the military details of Bear, Bear Creek's role in the War of 1812 and on Bear Creek society with a particular focus on uncovering the stories of the people of color who lived there. There's very little if anything known about the people of color who lived in in that area around that time so that history will also be incorporated into the trail thank you and yeah i'm i can also answer maybe not all questions but between lilling and myself we should be able to answer all questions thank you so much thank you phyllis and caitlin anybody else not anyone else from the public so if you have any um discussion or you know questions for the applicant um you guys can ask me how to represent us, Phyllis and William. Commissioners, any thoughts, any questions, anything we need to talk about? Hi. We, I'm sorry, we also have um, Marsha McLaughlin that um, would like to speak. Hey, Marsha. Marsha, you're unmuted. Thank you. Um, thank you for including me. Are you getting reverb? Um, my husband, John Alexander, and I are members of the board of Neighbor Space and have been involved with the steering committee since its inception. And I think this all got started because while the community is very proud of their role in the war of 1812, the, the pieces are not well connected. And the intent is to be able to connect Battle Acre to the North Point State Park, but also to Bear Creek, which is how the British arrived via water. And the waterfront is generally not accessible in many parts of this area. So this is only the very first step in a trail that will include both historic and environmental interpretation to hopefully both attract more students, their parents, and also maybe visitors from other parts of the state. The committee has been very excited about finally having money from the county executive and the, to get this started. And we're hopeful that the commission will support approval of this first step because we have several more phases we need to move forward on. 
Thank, thank you. Thank you, Marcia, for those remarks. We appreciate it. Um, commission, um, any any questions? Any anything we need to clarify? Um, one of the letters of opposition mentioned archaeological. Archaeological work been done at this site to make sure that throwing away or disturbing artifacts that might be in the area of work. Um, Phyllis, is that a question you can answer? Sure, yeah. So um, we do actually have funds set aside to hire an archaeologist <laughs> to um, do that type of work. We just understood from him that, um, you know, it makes, we need to know first if there's a trail going in and where, and then he can, um, you know, walk that area and, and and provide advice on on what the best next step would be. So yes, that can absolutely be done before breaking ground. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any follow up on that, Chris? That, no, I just uh, wanted to make sure that, that no artifacts were lost in the construction of the trail. Sure. Sure. Commissioners, any other questions? Hi, this is Ray. I have a question about how the, the, the trail will proceed from Battle Acre to the uh, to the park on North Point Road. Is does it go behind the the shopping center? Um, Martha, is that one you might be able to answer? Marcia? Yeah. I can speak to that too, Mr. Oh, Mr. okay. Thanks, Phyllis. Yeah. Um so I'm sorry, was the question how we're coming out of the park on North, North Point Road and connecting to the state battlefield? Yes, is 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 the planned route down North Point Road from the park down to Battle Acre? Um, yes, yeah, so there is a there is an existing crosswalk on North Point Road. So we would follow the sidewalk to that crosswalk and we are talking to Baltimore County about um, safety enhancements to that crosswalk and then use the sidewalk on the other side of the road. Again, we're just in conversation with Baltimore County about um, bringing that sidewalk up to Baltimore County trail standards, and then that would lead into the state battlefield. Thank you. And then the, the new path, I think will come out behind the, the Battle Acre. And is that path supposed to be connected to go over to Bear Creek? Correct. So we're also working on that. Um, we the shopping center owner is happy to work with us to enhance you know, improve that um the sidewalk that's currently there it's not in very good shape so we would probably improve that um, and then also you can see where there's currently the existing opening some improvements need to be made there as well to make that ada accessible and safe but yes yeah, so we'll continue along um, the sidewalk the alley and then down to the waterfront Okay, so it does the trail will go through the alley and then out to I can't remember the name of that road, but Walt, over it's to Walter the Gray. Field. Does it go over to the athletic fields uh, behind the, uh, the Charles Mont apartments? Um, so we have an easement behind the Charles Mont apartments that takes you down from Walford Drive down to the water. And then from there, it would follow the waterfront. Um, behind the schools. That is still, that's the next phase. So this Baltimore County funding covers the first, this first part down to the water um, and not yet past that. So we'll have to work with the schools to see what works for them as far as safety. Okay, Thanks. 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 That, that's the information I needed. Thank you. Thank you. And any other um, comments or questions, commissioners? Hearing none, do we have a- I have a um, question. Sure, Lily. Sorry, this is Lily. I have a question. Um, um, I just wanted to understand kind of the phasing um, that of the changes that are happening to um, to the monument. Um, are the, this slide that is currently showing, um, the proposed paver field, is that going to be implemented already or is, has that been put to the side? So that's part of a different grant project that's separate from this. Um, so it's not part of this. Uh, I, I understand. Um, right. I understand. But I think what's problematic is not seeing the full picture of 
of something like we're only seeing the proposal of the second of this other grant and the drawings don't show the first part whether or not that's implemented so i i guess what i'm saying is is that okay so that will be happening and then this concrete walk will continue on the other side is that what yes so like those little side pieces that the um commission approved last march okay. um hasn't been happened yet um because okay. it's through like state fund grant funding so um okay it's coming soon i i have to yeah. would have to check with uh jay doyle who is um yeah. So part of that my, yeah, my my only comment was that if if there was some consideration of improving that connection on the other side of how the how the walk interfaces with this uh with the um uh, with the center then will it follow that this other um this other uh concrete walk will also need something similar on this end that, that was my only question. Like, if if you're looking at how the two interface with the with the polygon in the center, um, that was my only. Um, I just needed to clarify what was happening when. So, Miss Miss Munder, if I could, I can address um, at least part of your question. So, as Miss Merritt alluded to, Jay Doyle is um, the person who was the leading the effort for those other improvements. He we we talk regularly to make sure that we're not interfering with his plans. Um, and we were hoping to be able to coordinate our scheduling, but it looks like um like we're a little bit ahead of his work. So we'll probably we're just making sure that our work fits in seamlessly to the projects that he has planned. It just looks like scheduling wise, we won't be able to get that all done at the same time. And then those two triangles, I don't know exactly the other commission members would probably know better than I do, but it was my understanding that those list the names of fallen soldiers, I think. So I'm not sure um, if your if your request was to maybe mirror that elsewhere in the park, I'm not sure that would work because I think the dimensions were specific to the number of names that um, they wanted to include. Yeah, those little triangles were just sort of like offsets and then they had, um, I believe, granite um, monuments that they're going to be putting in that does have, have the name. So it sort of people can view those names without blocking the pathway um, entrance into the park. And that's what those um, side triangles are. I made up papers. Hi, this is Ray again. Uh, when folks come out of the park and on the new sidewalk, come out into the alley in order to follow the trail over to Bear Creek, will there be signs or markers or a, a marked path? How will people know? Um, all of the above would be my answer. So, okay. yes, we, we're very aware that, you know, there's a plethora of surfaces here that people need to traverse. And so it won't, you know, it's not always obvious how the path will run. So it will be a mix of um, wayfinding signs, markers, either in the pavement or, um, you know, particular striping, something like that. We'll probably need to get creative there. Um, and there will also be interpretive signs highlighting that history that will be coming out of this other grant so hopefully you know hopefully that will and some landscaping as well so hopefully it'll be pretty easy to follow the trail okay and the opening at that gate at the the gate at that end on on the back side where the new trail is coming out will that have a gate or will it just be a permanent opening so that's also this is i know this is confusing that's also actually part of jay doyle's project so he already has the gate designed and planned um, that fits that that current opening. We're just making sure that um, that that apron and the walkway will fit exactly with with a proposed gate. So it looks like again, as far as timing, we're a little bit ahead. So our walkway and apron will probably be in place before the gate is installed. And then um, we met with the county, and it sounds like we could leave. So they need that entrance for maintenance. Um, so the gate, you know, will will be able to be opened when maintenance crews need to get in and probably one of the two leaves would be left open all the time so that trail users can walk in and out of the park. Thank you. 
Yes, and the LPC did approve the gate design, and that was one of the clarification questions. Uh, so it sounds like it's gonna, nothing's happening with the design of the gate that was approved. Correct. Commissioners, thank you for the questions. Are we ready to move to a motion? I would move that I'll we move to a certificate of appropriateness. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Do we have a second? I'll second it. This is Ray. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. Um, so, Jessica, could we do a roll call vote? Lily, please. Yes. Chris Parts. Yes. Chris Weston. Yes. Ed. Yes. Scott. Yes. Jamie. Yes. Ray. Yes. Vince. Yes. And John. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And thank you to our visitors. We so appreciate you coming and, and lending more information and context for us as we discuss that. Always appreciate it. Thank you. Next item up are the items for tax credits, I think. Yes. Are you? Just, I can go, Jessica. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so Don't fight um, over it. <laughs> um, the following um, historic property tax credit applications um, or historic review applications were approved by staff as either an emergency uh, repair um, or due to the receipt of a MH2 part, MHT part two approval for work um, already reviewed by Maryland Historical Trust. So we have the Warby Higby property at 1822 Frederick Row, which is the final landmark. Um, Oak Grove in its setting, and they have a MHC part 2 approval for geothermal heating system installation, various roof repairs and front front porch painting. And then we have the. Bio bio Jolly property um, at 503 Dunkirk, um, which is a contributing structure in the Annalise um, National Register historic district. So they had a part to approve a state or part state part to approval. Uh, for attic abatement work and basement uh, rim joist insulation. And then we have the DeHanzer property at uh, 513 Subbrook Lane, which is a contributing structure in the Subbrook Park County Historic District and the Subbrook Park National Register Historic District. So this was an emergency uh, repair review for an in-kind asphalt roof replacement due to an active uh, leaking roof. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I noticed that Jen and Jeffrey from the county planning department are on as we so appreciate um, you being with us tonight as always. Um, any other business that we need to um, consider Caitlin and Jessica? Hearing none, um, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Thank you. A second. And it was Chris Parts seconding and voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all. I know some of you made a special effort to get here, and I appreciate it, Lily, Chris, and, and Jamie coming in late. It's big help. We appreciate it. Thank Good, night. Thank Good night. Good night. Thank, Thank you. Good night. Bye. Bye, Bye. Hey, Ed. Yeah. Um, could I? Add, I have a question real quick before you go. Um, actually, this could have been to anybody, but um, if 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 we, if I, if someone needed to get a um, ground penetration done, where would they go? Who would they seek? Not sure. I'm, I'm not. I've never done ground penetrating uh, work before, but I don't know. Caitlin, do you have any ideas on that? Um, so that it's usually a probably from a contracting company that are that um do that some archaeological consultants do that but there's a few that yeah. have the equipment. And what um what what is it for is it personal or is it for the museum this this would be for the museum and i don't have any um the, the, because um are this, you looking for graves well when they were initially looking at trying to do a, a parking, extending, expanding the parking, mm -hmm. it was on the side where the graves are. Okay, that's just that's just impractical. 
because so the... um Towson University has a GPR machine that they um you know they they would do it for I don't quote me on this okay. but uh Kat yeah. Sterner uh Kat Sterner is the professor uh she's the tenured professor there and um she's always looking for projects um to do with her students um Tom Horsley I believe comes down from PA to do a lot of the GPR. Okay. Um, and then there's another consult. I can, I can look up some folks. So what, what, about, um, what about Zach Singer? With the yeah, state? MHT. So, I mean, you know, you could look for a grant from MHT, but again, it's, it's like, who is going to cost the most? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, could, work would be a great project. A great What's project. That? I think so. I'm a professor. I jump at that project. Yeah, I, you know, if you don't mind, um, I, I can put you in touch with Dr. Sterner. Um, I would probably go to her before because she's local. Um, then reach out to MHT because, especially with Maryland Archaeology Month coming up in April, they're busy as all, all can be. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I'll, I'll put you in touch with some folks. But yeah, that's, I mean be a nice project yeah that sounds great it's very interesting yeah, that'd be fun but were you saying that the um you want to survey the area beneath um the parking lot yeah so oh, okay, yeah that's, that's gonna sorry. be tough because it's it's probably already going to be significantly disturbed so when they look at the stratigraphic readings on uh the you know the magnetometry it's like so you might not be able to see anything on it that's kind of hard if it's going to be under the park the parking lot but um yeah dr sterner will, it, will answer that it wouldn't it, now because you've seen it right i've seen it yeah jessica hasn't been out so oh, no, I know you're having out. like some drainage issues on that side okay. where the, yeah on the side where the parking lot is uh -huh. mm-hmm just outside okay. the parking lot, with toward the grass, it's okay. really it's there's there are places where it's sinking. Mm -hmm. and I I I really think obviously they they need to have more parking. That would be the ideal location. However, I don't know how practical it would be if you've got, you know, groundwater or whatever it is underground, you know, running down there and that's causing that. And then there's a slope away. You you have only so much room to work with. I don't know what if that's practical, but I I, I did want to follow up on something that was kind of landed in my lap. So, mm -hmm. but I didn't know if there was any local if 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 if, if there were because I think that when they initially did this, they had someone uh, in Pennsylvania. That's Tom. That's Tom Bors Borsby. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He does most of it um, down here in Maryland. But um, I mean, he's a great guy. Uh, but if you can get Towson to do it for free, then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like free. You explain your nonprofit <laughs> small small local museum. <laughs> right. Free and is, yeah. So Okay, I, I appreciate that input. Ed Ed, did I hear you say you're a professor? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> See that if I was a professor, I would oh, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. You I'll, your I'll send you, to it. <laughs> yeah, no, really. I mean yeah, <laughs> there, there needs to be more collaboration with student projects. I think with preservation mm -hmm. stuff, if there were more programs, like, yeah, you know, like sure. building trades, like yeah. Harvard Community College used to do that. Used to have that. One one of the things that this this is sort of an aside. One of the things that um, I put down because since Mr. Dix has passed away, his son is now the 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 president, and oh, yours great. truly is vice president. Um, one of the things that um, I'm looking at is more involvement with students, um, you know, college students and maybe even high school students who might want to volunteer or do maybe some of their, if they're doing service learning, uh, something that would uh, generate some interest, but also connect with uh, I really do. One of Mr. Diggs's um, passions was education, and so we want to continue that uh, that part of his legacy. So, 
Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, I um I'll I'll send you um an email with some of the folks that I know through archaeology and um that get you in touch directly with Dr. Sterner. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. All right. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you, you staying over. Caitlin, uh, great presentation today. It was, yeah, it was, it was a it lot was entertaining. Of, I loved it. It was yeah, me uh, too. Me too. I get excited about talking about like the structural system. I don't know if anybody else. <laughs> the whole thing. Was so, interesting. so, so, I, so I guess I'm not the only uh, nerd in the group. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not exactly. I like related kind of to the whole the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. it was good. I enjoyed Thank it. You. Made it fun tonight. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. See you all. All right, All right, take care. Have a good I'll evening. See ya. Have a good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.